Okay, so hi everybody and welcome to our fourth Michaelmas talk for the Oxford Space and Astronomy Society. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, today we're delighted and humbled to have such a distinguished speaker with us here today, Professor Stephen Balbus. Um, so to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Balbus is the civilian professor of astronomy at the University of Oxford. He did his undergraduate work at MIT and then received his PhD in theoretical astrophysics from UC Berkeley. Uh, in 2013, he shared the Shaw Prize in Astronomy with John Hawley for his work on magnetorotational instability in accretion disks. Um, Professor Balbus is a fellow of the Royal Society and is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. And this year he was awarded the prestigious Eddington Medal for the, from the Royal Astron Astronomical Society. Um, so with such an impressive and distinguished background, Professor, we're so honoured and so humbled to have you here talking to us today and uh, giving us your, your time um, to speak to us about black holes. Um, so without further ado, uh, Professor, over to you. Thank you, Hannah, for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm always happy to have an excuse to talk about black holes just at a moment's notice. And so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, addressing a group of uh, students who are motivated and interested. So I'm going to put my talk into presentation mode. Oh, let's see, let me go back. Maybe I should, I think I have to share the screen first. Yep. So if I do that, And now I is that working? Can I, Hannah? Uh, yes, we can see. Uh, you you can see we're where we want to be. Yeah. All right. Then I, I will continue. So I'm going to talk today about uh, how astronomers see black holes, which is not a particularly easy task. And I'm also going to, how shall I say, I'm going to honor the title in the breach a little bit because I'm going to tell, tell you a bit about how astronomers see other difficult to see objects like inside the earth and inside the sun, and as well as seeing black holes with all kinds of different methods. So, the usual way, of course, that astronomers have seen things over the centuries is with light. And we now know, of course, that light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. And it's worth just saying a few words about it because I'm going to come back several times later in the talk to make reference to the wave properties of light. So light, of course, is an oscillating electric field accompanied by a magnetic field. And the fact that light is a wave means that it has some remarkable properties. In particular, if we superpose light waves, we add them up, which in the course of observations, as we'll see, is something that occurs often, you can get two very different results depending upon whether the crests of one wave align with the crests of another wave, so-called constructive interference, which you see schematically on the left of your screen, or if the two waves are exactly counter-aligned so that the crest of one wave falls upon a trough of another wave, then not just at the crest and trough, but everywhere you'll get complete cancellation. And that is known as destructive interference. And this is a really great trick and in various different guises and with more and more layers of complexity, essentially this process is used in many different ways to trick the universe into revealing itself. And I hope to give you a taste of that as the talk goes on. 
So let's do a little bit of mathematics. This is a physics talk after all. And I just explain what happens when you get complete constructive interference and what happens when you get complete destructive interference. What about if you're kind of halfway in between? So here we have a little mathematical equation at the bottom. Cosine omega t, there's one wave, plus cosine omega t plus phi. So phi is an angle that we add so that one wave is offset arbitrarily. Now, it's a pretty simple exercise in trigonometry to do that sum. And on the right side of the equation, you see that if you have an arbitrary offset, I haven't made any assumptions about whether phi is big or small, this is an exact equation, then I get, as you see, two cosine phi over two, which is a constant, if phi is constant, and then another cosine, which multiplies it, cosine omega t plus the offset phi over two. And that's a very general result. So what happens now if I add up two cosine waves like that, and there's an offset phi, but phi itself depends upon t, depends upon time. So in particular, I wanna look at the case where I have cosine omega t is added to cosine omega t plus pi. So if that was all I have, that would get exactly destructive interference because adding pi simply makes the, crofts, the, the crests line up with the troughs and the troughs line up with the crest exactly out of phase. But I don't want it exactly out of phase. I want a little bit left over. I, that's what that x represents in the equation. And that's going to be some kind of a signal. And you'll see more precisely what I mean when we look at particular examples. In any case, if I apply my trigonometric formula and I plug it into the right side, I get this rather complicated looking expression. But if I now make the additional assumption, which is true in every case of practical interest, that the quantity x is small, then the right side reduces in that limit to what you see over here. x comes out of the trigonometric function, it's an amplitude, and it gets multiplied by sine omega t. So this will be the net result. If I have x equal to some small number epsilon times sine of big omega t, then the result is that the signal is the envelope of an ordinary sine or cosine function. And what you see is that if big omega is much smaller than little omega, and you get lots and lots and lots of oscillations and then a gradual modulation of the amplitude. That's called amplitude modulation. And in fact, it's the way the original radios work. There would be an electromagnetic signal, which was the sine little omega t, and it would be modified by the effect of a sound wave, which is the sine big omega t. But anyway, there's a little bit of mathematics and I'm going through it now because I'm going to refer to it later in the talk. Back to astronomy. So what you see here is a standard picture of how a Newtonian reflector works, which is actually the basis of just about all telescopes now used in astronomy. You see the red light waves coming in they bounce off the back of a para parabolic shaped mirror. And the property of a parabola in this particular situation is that it reflects the light waves to a single focus where for the case of this telescope, you put a secondary mirror that deflects the light to an eyepiece. In other telescopes, you would have some kind of detector or more complicated, more fancy, instrumentation at the location of the secondary mirror where you would do your analysis. 
So we see this as well in contemporary telescope. This is a picture of the Keck 10 meter telescope. So it's 10 meters across in diameter. And you can see the hexagonal plates that make up the mirror. And just to give you some scale of this, there is a technician, say six feet tall in front of the 10 meter telescope. So you can get an idea of the enormous scale of these things. So this is an optical telescope. It's also possible to see with what amounts to a radio. You can use a radio telescope in the same way. Here's the Parkes radio telescope in Australia. It too has a parabolic shape. The radio waves in this case come in, bounce off, and then they're collected at the focus of the parabola where instrumentation can analyze the signals. It's possible with very large radio telescopes, and as we'll see in a moment, with arrays of radio telescope to get very, very high resolutions and to make actual images, to take pictures as it were, in the same way that you use optical light to take pictures. So here's a picture of a radio galaxy. And what it shows is the galaxy viewed at low resolution. These are contours of constant radio intensities. Then you can zoom in, as you see in the second image, and about a factor of 10, which reveals an inner jet-like structure and then if you go further down, another factor of 100,000, which is possible, with another instrument, you reveal that that jet-like orientation is preserved even on the smallest scales. So this is about a million light years, 100,000 light years, and then the smallest scale is a single light year. Believe it or not, astronomers also can see with sound. Now that should be familiar to you. We know about the Earth's interior essentially because we can bang on the Earth with an earthquake and watch how the waves spread from inside. So if we have an earthquake occur and it in this diagram, of course, it doesn't have to be at the North Pole. We've simply oriented the Earth in such a way to picture the distribution of the waves more easily. There are two types of earthquake waves. There are P waves or pressure waves. And the pressure waves can go through either liquid or solid. They are compressive. And there's S waves, shear waves. S waves can only propagate through solid and not at all through liquid. And when an earthquake occurs, by looking at the distribution of the P waves and the S waves on the other side of the Earth and the shadows that are cast, it's possible to reconstruct the nature of the interior of the Earth, in particular, the fact that the Earth has a liquid core is revealed by the pattern of P waves and S waves at the surface. We can do the same thing on the sun. Here is a schematic, if it works, there we go, little presentation shows an of the surface of the sun. You can see the oscillations. And by analyzing them, size. we by analyzing the oscillations, we can learn about what's in the interior. I'm not sure if you're getting interference with the narration. Sorry about that. I will move on. So here we have a picture of what one particular acoustic mode, pulsing mode of oscillation inside the sun looks like. You see blue and red referring to peaks and troughs of the compression. And what we can do by looking at the surface, we can analyze what kind of a spectrum 
of these modes is present at the level of understanding thousands and thousands of different modes. We can pick out individual frequencies. And by knowing which modes are present at the surface, we can then reconstruct what kind of a structure, what kind of a density structure, what kind of a temperature structure gave rise to the modes. We can do what is known as the inverse problem and reconstruct what goes on inside the sun. And we can do that to a fantastic degree. We have a very detailed model. In some ways, I, we probably understand the interior of the sun better than we understand the interior of the earth because the sun is a hot gas and we understand its equation of state better than we do solid material. In any case, we now know that the sun consists of three principal units in its interior, a core where nuclear reactions take place, a so-called outer radiative zone, extends about 70% to the surface. The radiative zone is where heat diffuses outward, and then an outer convective zone. And the convection zone is marked by turbulent motions, very similar to boiling water. In this case, a gas which is boiling at a few million degrees. And that is the mechanism by which the heat escapes in the outermost layers of the sun, the outer 30% or so. We can predict not only the gross structure, but because of the fact that the sun is rotating, the rotation actually affects the frequencies of these modes. And by looking precisely at what frequencies are present and how sometimes they're split into two very closely related neighboring frequencies, we can actually reconstruct the rather delicate motions associated with the rotational pattern inside the sun. We know that's pretty amazing. I always have to say it twice because it's uh, such a, a remarkable result. We can see inside the sun and see how it is differentially rotating and you get a remarkable pattern. What you're looking at on this screen are contours of constant rotation velocity. So the sun is rotating at a constant velocity along each one of these lines. And you get this differential rotation in the convective zone and then almost solid body in the radiative zone. And the pattern for this is still not precisely, well, in fact, not, I shouldn't say precisely, it's still not very well understood. So if you're looking for a good problem, here's one you might want to think about. And we learn all of this through what is called helio seismology, an analogy to the Earth's geoseismology. 30% pole to a crater variation in the rotation rate. Let's talk about seeing now with good old fashioned electromagnetic radiation. First question to ask, what really is radiation? And I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail rather than just telling you it's a wave, because the mechanism by which it is produced will be of interest to us when we talk about gravitational radiation. So here's a close up picture. So the, what I'm showing here are the lines of force. This is the direction of the lines of electrical force near a positive charge. And if you look at that little square that I've drawn, it looks like I've been a little bit careless. I've kind of cut off one side and it's not quite in the center. And that's not entirely because of the limitations of my, you know, my Photoshop abilities. What I've actually done is kind of hide the complexity of the real problem that I'm interested in. What this charge actually is, it's a little charge that began at the circle here and was stationary. 
And then between this little circle and this little spike circle, it did a, boop, a sudden acceleration up to some finite velocity, and then it stopped. And between this little circle and the black dot here, the charge has been coasting at a constant velocity. And what you see is something very interesting. The bits of the line of force that are close to the charge are pointing directly at it. The bits of the lines of force that are farther away from the charge are pointing to where the charge was for all time before the acceleration started. So those are those red lines. And then in between that green circle, there's a glitch where the transition occurs. So you have the lines of force are trying to keep up with where the charge is and point to it, but there's only a finite speed with which the lines of force can adjust. And that is the basis, that transition, that little green circle as it moves outward, that really is what radiation is in the classical picture. So if I look at a kink in the line of force and I examine it just in isolation, that kink moves out at the speed of light. That's the stiffness of an electrical line of force. And of course, in more detail, it's not just an electrical line of force, there's a magnetic field and so forth, but that's the picture. The kink moves out at the speed of light. And it's kind of silly to say that the kink moves out at the speed of light because the kink is light, actually. And the neat thing is that this picture that I've just drawn of kinks in the line of force, gravitational radiation behaves very similarly. There are Newtonian, if you will, Newtonian lines of force that get kinked. Of course, in the modern way of looking at it with Albert Einstein, what we're really looking at, we now know is not so much kinks in the lines of force, but a kink in space and space time, which represents the propagation of gravitational disturbances. Moving on, what about black holes? That was the whole that was what I promised you. How do you see black holes? It's time to talk about what a black hole is, a little bit about the history and some of the techniques that people use just in the last few years that have enabled us to learn a huge amount about these objects. And how do we see them? To talk about black holes, let's go back to 1676, because that was the first time in the history of humanity when people understood that the speed of light is finite. It was measured by Ole Romer using the moons of Jupiter and the delay of when the moons were observed to emerge from behind Jupiter, depending upon the Earth's location and how much longer it would take for the light to cross the solar system. A few years later, modern physics was born. Well, I shouldn't say not modern physics. Physics itself was born with the publication of Newtonian's Principia, classical mechanics arrived. About a hundred years later, John Mitchell, who was at Cambridge and who has become completely obscure. And his fame has just sort of been recognized in the last 50 years or so, since 1970, when people started to appreciate black holes. 
Mitchell came up with the concept of a black hole. Laplace did so independently, not very much longer after that. And Laplace, of course, is a scientific giant. And so for many years, that concept was associated with him. But John Mitchell was really the first. And he posed the question, are there stars in the universe so dense that the escape velocity from their surface would exceed the speed of light? And he treated the problem, of course, with Newtonian mechanics. So he set the kinetic energy, V squared over two, kinetic energy per unit mass, V squared over two, putting in for V, C, the speed of light, C squared over two. And he set that to equal to the potential energy, GM over R, and then solved for R arriving at this expression for the radius of such a dark star. That's the escape velocity. Or I should say, if C is the escape velocity, the speed of light, its radius would have to be two times Newton's G times the mass of the object divided by C squared. Now I've written R sub S because that's really the modern notation that we use. You'll see what the S stands for in a moment, but there is an argument that that should be R sub M for Mitchell, but let's stick with R sub S because that's customary. And in any case, it has a value. It is, if I plug in numbers for G and I use the mass of the sun and the speed of light, it is three kilometers. You'd have to take the sun, squeeze it down to three kilometers, and then you would have a star whose escape velocity would be equal to that of light. And then more generally, for an arbitrary mass, you take that three kilometers and multiply by the mass measured in units of solar masses. So for two solar masses, the radius is six kilometers, etc. Now, just to get an idea, oh, not coming to that yet, I want to take just a moment to talk about John Mitchell because he's become one of my favorite people. He was an incredible genius. He was 100 or 200 years of his ahead of his time, and people had no idea what to make of his ideas, but they're astonishing. So let me just spend 30 seconds running through some of the notions that John Mitchell came up with. He devised methods of making powerful magnets, of measuring magnetic forces as a function of distance from these objects. He came up with some of the most important ideas in seismology and earthquake. Remember the P waves and the S waves? It was John Mitchell who suggested that earthquakes propagate as waves through the solid earth. John Mitchell understood that the earth had a crust John Mitchell understood that there are strata that are laid down over time and preserve the geological record, something that took people 100 years to fully exploit. John Mitchell introduced the concept of binary stars. The double stars that astronomers were seeing were gravitationally bound to one another and in orbits around one another and in principle, by observing for a long enough period, you could see this. John Mitchell said, you can measure gravity directly on the Earth, not here in space, if you got two big rocks and a very, very sensitive torsion balance. The so-called Cavendish experiment, which Cavendish did, was John Mitchell's idea. And unfortunately, he died before he could actually carry it out and left it to Cavendish to do so. A hundred years before Maxwell, John Mitchell's talking about radiation pressure, how to measure it. He put a compass in very intense sunlight to see whether the needle would budge. What he found was that the needle did move because it melted, not because it moved. And we, can certainly understand that. If you go outside in the sun, you feel hot, but you're not knocked over. There is, of course, such a thing as radiation pressure, but it's a lot less than the thermal content 
of sunlight. Nevertheless, it was a concept he came up with. And then the final, the most astonishing thing was not only did he invent binary stars and the astronomer William Herschel, in fact, discovered binary stars and rigorously proved their existence based on Mitchell's suggestion. But he also suggested that the best place to look for a black hole is in a binary star system where you would see one star doing its orbit, but you wouldn't see the other star because it was a black hole. So this guy's talking about binary black holes in 1793. And of course, we do use binary stars as part of the key objects that are essential or that provided some of the earliest evidence for black holes. A remarkable man. All right, moving on. Here is a map of Oxford, and I put the sun, <laughs> believe it or not, in the middle of this. That's that dark shadow. That's the size of the sun, just to give you kind of a feeling. You take the, the mass of the sun, and you kind of put it somewhere between Headington and Grand Pomp, and that's what you would need to get a black hole. So these are truly astonishing objects. And the universe we now know is full of these things. Let's move on 150 years into the future. Talk about another key figure in this game, Albert Einstein in 1915, published his first complete account of general relativity in which gravity is not a force, but a geometrical distortion in space-time and objects that are moving on orbits, we should not think of as moving under the direction of an external force. They are simply navigating their way through space-time, following the shortest possible path in a way that Einstein made precise. And that is how gravity, we now know, uh, really works. Relativity has become a precision science. So Einstein, you recognize on the left. I'm not so sure you'll recognize the gentleman on the right, but he is another extremely important astrophysicist. This is Carl Schwarzschild. And Carl Schwarzschild, within a month, of Einstein's paper came up with the first rigorous black hole solution on his own in the trenches in World War I. And he wrote a very poignant letter to Einstein, which I've quoted here. It says, as you see, the war treated me kindly enough in spite of the heavy gunfire to allow me to get away from it all and take this walk in the land of your ideas. So notice the date, the 22nd of December, barely a month after general relativity is presented as a theory, Martin Schwartz, excuse me, Carl Schwarzschild solves the equations, the field equations of Albert Einstein rigorously for a point mass. And there is his, his paper. The German says, on the gravitational field of a mass point following Einstein's theory, literally weeks after the theory is published. And I'm putting in a plug, you, I misspoke a second ago, I referred to Martin Schwarzschild. Martin Schwarzschild is Carl Schwarzschild's son, who was for many years a professor at Princeton. And I'm happy to say uh, I, I am old enough to have uh, gotten to know him fairly well. He was a, uh, he too was a remarkable gentleman and became uh, extremely well known as well and was responsible for our uh, present day understanding of how stars evolve and what their internal structure is. So Schwarzschild's solution, what we would now call a black hole solution, just to be clear, 
this is, this is not a star in the usual sense of some kind of an object, but instead it's a description of how the vacuum space time, and you have to lump that together because space and time are all interwoven, how that space time geometry is distorted, is changed as you get arbitrarily close to a mathematical point of some finite mass. So let's pause and ask ourselves, we're talking, this is now 1916. So is this for real? Was Einstein, I mean, excuse me, was Schwarzschild really thinking along the lines of a point-like singularity? No, I'm, Schwarzschild would have said, and I think Einstein would have agreed, that his solution is only valid outside a finite sphere of spherical mass, surely. It's not just like the one over r squared force law that we use in Newtonian theory. That's true, that's exactly true, outside a spherical distribution of mass, but we don't really think that there are masses in the universe that go down to r equals zero. And that was certainly the way Schwarzschild thought of it at the time. You need two solutions. The Schwarzschild solution applies out here, and then you have some kind of a distribution of mass. And you need another solution in the interior. And by the way, Schwarzschild found that solution as well. So, the Schwarzschild so-called black hole solution applies out here, but not inside the object itself. And certainly what Schwarzschild had in mind was some kind of an object, not a single point. And here mathematically is how things change. In the absence of mass, if there's a time interval dt, when I have mass present, it changes to dt times the square root of one minus r sub s over r, where r sub s is the quantity that we saw earlier on John Mitchell's slide, 2gm divided by the speed of light squared. So now you understand what the s stands for. It stands for Carl Schwarzschild, the first person who actually derived that radius correctly in the context of general relativity. Meanwhile, spatial intervals, dr, there's a radial spatial interval, gets stretched out. So in the absence of mass, if you had dr, in the presence of mass, that same coordinate separation would be extended to dr divided by the same quantity, square root of one minus r sub s over r. And in particular, the speed of light, if I do it in terms of the proper dr divided by the proper dt, that is equal to the speed of light c times this quantity one minus r sub s over r. In other words, you notice this goes to zero when little r, when the photon is at the Schwarzschild radius this dr dt, which would be what we observe the light to be doing, it appears to be frozen to a stop. Remarkable. Here's an embedding, what's called an embedding diagram. So don't pay attention to the one on the right. That's Reisner Nordstrom. I'll explain that in a moment. This is what the spatial distortion of a Schwarzschild black hole would do. So the dr is kind of the difference between each of these little lines in this spider web. And then as I approach the Schwarzschild radius down here in red, this stretching tells you exactly how the dr is distorted. It gives you kind of an intuitive feeling. The Reisner Nordstrom is the same kind of a black hole, but with a charge. And believe it or not, no sooner had Carl Schwarzschild found his solution, but two other astrophysicists, Reisner and Nordstrom, 
figured out what a black hole would look like if it had electrical charge. And of course, I don't have time to talk about it in this talk, but you get a slightly different distortion. And it reminded me, just looking at it, of a champagne glass. So what did I do? Well, I went to Nordstrom.com, of course, what else? And sure enough, I found champagne flutes. And I swear, I think somebody who designed these glasses must know general relativity because they certainly look like an embedding diagram for the Reisner Nordstrom metric. All right, let's get serious. Things started to happen in the 1930s. In 1932, Subramanian Chandra Sekhar showed that the cores of stars, according to the laws now pretty much of special relativity, they have a maximum mass of about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And they have a maximum mass because as a star's core, what's called a white dwarf, as it gets more and more massive, the equation of state becomes softer. Essentially, the electrons get squeezed so tightly that their uncertainty principle momentum causes them effectively to resist, to vibrate, but they can only move back and forth at the speed of light. And that causes an effective softening of the equation of state. And that softening means that you can't get more than 1.4 solar masses without a collapse occurring. Here's an actual picture of a white dwarf. I don't think I had seen this before, which is why I included it in the talk. What you're looking at is the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. That's right in the center. And Sirius is actually one of John Mitchell's binary stars. And that little companion dot that you see, this was a photograph, by the way, taken by a very skilled amateur astronomer. That is Sirius B. That is the white dwarf that accompanies Sirius A, the big bright star. And Sirius B is a very hot, but very, very small star. And it was a total mystery at the time it was discovered. So the theory of white dwarf stars is now, has now been thoroughly confirmed. These are stars as I was suggesting that are supported by the degeneracy pressure of electrons. P pressure goes like density rho to some power gamma. And when the electrons are not relativistic, gamma is five thirds. When the electrons become relativistic, gamma is four thirds. And that change makes all the difference and sets an upper limit. There is another kind of star, a neutron star, which is one thing that can happen to a white dwarf that is bigger than 1.4 solar masses. It can collapse and all the electrons and protons recombine into a neutron star. Neutron stars are supported by the degeneracy pressure of neutrons, and they have a more complicated equation of state. The maximum mass of a neutron star seems to be about 2.2 solar masses, still an area of investigation. The radius, not much bigger than a Schwarzschild radius, 10 kilometers. And I make a note about a year ago, the most massive neutron star ever discovered came in at about 2.1 solar masses. The theory of neutron stars goes back to these gentlemen here, Oppenheimer and Volkoff, who derived the theory of stellar force balance in Einstein's general relativity theory, hydrostatic equilibrium, in which the pressure gradient is balanced off against gravity. And interestingly enough, when you solve that equation, this is a graph, that one of my students in the general relativity course prepared last year. I should 
give him a plug. Ludovic Fraser Taliente plotted this up. And this is a numerical solution of that equation. What's very interesting here, this is the central density on the x-axis. This is the mass of the star that you obtain. And when you solve it, just assuming that you have an ideal gas supported by neutron degeneracy pressure, the maximum mass you get is only 0.7 solar masses. That's interesting. It's less than the Chandrasekhar mass of 1.4. It's only when you include more realistic equations of state. That turns out to be very important for neutron stars, that the maximum mass, it makes a very big difference. It's about three times the size of this Oppenheimer-Volkov mass. Neutron stars turn out to be terrific things because they rotate very, very rapidly and they have big magnetic fields. And through some mechanism or other that we still don't understand in detail, that rotation turns into very precise radio pulses. So they act like clocks. And those clocks are sufficiently accurate that when you have neutron stars, in very close binary systems, you can actually do tests of general relativity. More about Robert Oppenheimer with another one of his students. The same year, Oppenheimer and Snyder were the first people to show how not just a neutron star, but a real black hole could be created from a spherically symmetric spherical collapse all the way down to a point. Now, the original Oppenheimer and Snyder calculation showed how to do that assuming you had perfect spherical symmetry. But nobody believed you'd have perfect spherical symmetry all the way down. And so black holes and whether they could form were a matter of controversy. Until 1965, when Roger Penrose showed that, in fact, even if you don't have spherical symmetry, the conditions under which black holes form are very general and probably inevitable. So there you see Roger on the left, Oxford's own Roger Penrose, who of course, as I'm sure you all know, won this year's Nobel Prize in physics for this work. And on the right, you have one of his crazy, but fascinating and extremely interesting Penrose diagrams that he invented. And I'll spend just a moment to kind of go over what that is. But in a Penrose diagram, time goes up and you have two spatial dimensions. And what you follow here is kind of the collapse of this disk, which represents, a, say, the equator of the star as it moves up through time. And then where you see this black ring, that is where the Schwarzschild radius is. That's what Roger Penrose in this picture called the trapped surface. And once a trapped surface forms, he showed it's impossible to avoid a singularity. So the question is whether you can get to a trapped surface. And in fact, it's not as hard as you might think. It sounds hard to take the sun and compress it down to something which is the size of Oxford. On the other hand, you can also form a trap surface over a very, very large region. My favorite example is just take something that has the density of the Earth's atmosphere and put it in a sphere the size of the outer solar system. So that's not a completely crazy density, and it's not a completely crazy length. We can comprehend that. That is enough to form a trap surface. So black holes, Roger showed in 1965, and it only took 55 years for him to get a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, black holes form under very general conditions, and we now know 
experimentally that that is true. We see black holes everywhere. So how do you see? I just said you see black holes everywhere. How do you see a black hole? So I have a black hole in this picture. Where's the black hole? You see it? Here, let me help. I put two of them. Is that any easier if there are two black holes? Well, yes, actually. Because then you can see them with their gravity. Here is a movie, a video of two black holes in the final stages of coalescence. So this isn't something that even John Mitchell, I bet, thought up. Here we have one of his binary stars, but with two black holes. He might have thought that was pointless. If you have two black holes, you can't possibly see them. But what you're looking at here is in fact the distortion of space in terms of the, not really compression, but kind of the sheer distortion of space that accompanies, that accompanies the coalescence of two black holes. And in the final stages, it's very, very intense. And it's precisely that distortion of space that is measured by the modern devices which have detected gravitational radiation. So you can see two black holes if they're dancing around one another. And that is what the wave signal looks like. So what you see is a distortion of space. That's kind of what's being plotted. How much stretching there is at various stages of the black hole's coalescence. So the wave gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And then when the two black holes merge, all the parts of the merger, which are not spherically symmetric, get radiated away. And ultimately, it all stops at the end. Oops, going backwards. Here is the device that actually measures gravitational radiation. This is an interferometer. What you have is two lasers bouncing back and forth at right angles to one another. And the laser comes in here. Oh, excuse me, you have one laser, excuse me. And it goes through a beam splitter, bounces off the test mass, mass and comes back. And then another portion of the same laser bounces off the test mass at right angles and comes back and gets analyzed. And when there is no gravitational wave passing through, the setup in this is that you have, remember, the destructive interference between two light waves. So the photo detector, which is focused right in this region where the beams are split and recombined, it sees nothing because you have precise cancellation of the peaks and the troughs of the laser radiation. When a gravitational wave comes by and distorts this kind of circle of test masses that I have here, one of the arms contracts and the other extends and that precise cancellation doesn't work anymore. So you set the device up so that there is a null when there's no gravitational wave. And that corresponds to destructive interference in our little diagram. What about when there is a gravitational wave? Well, that corresponds to that little mathematical exercise that I did earlier in the talk. Then you have a slight offset, this signal X represents the offset, the phase mismatch between the two arms. And the signal you see in that photo detector is simply x multiplied by sine omega t, where omega now is the frequency of the lasers. And x has built into it the frequency of the gravitational wave. 
So essentially what you read out, let's see, is what I have here. The sine omega t, these are the oscillations of the laser and they are modified by this envelope, which I've written here as epsilon, epsilon, epsilon sine capital omega t. That is a simple gravitational wave signal. That's what the observers read out. There's the actual LIGO facility in Hanford, Washington, with the two great four kilometer long interferometer arms. And there's the actual signal. In red, this is kind of the raw data, the raw data from two different locations, from Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana, where there's another device. And to be sure that it wasn't just noise they were looking at, they had to see two simultaneous signals at both facilities, to, which duplicated one another to be sure it truly was a gravitational wave. And in fact, not quite simultaneous because it takes a fraction of a second to actually cross between Washington and Louisiana. And that was part of the experiment. The signal, in fact, you, the raw data was almost so clean, just in and of itself, you could just sit there and practically read it off the meter. It is now possible by having many different types of facilities to actually localize the origin of these sources and see, kind of smeared out, but getting better and better with time, to actually be able to form some kind of an image just with gravitational waves. So how do we do this? Remember this? This is this fantastic picture of possibly an event horizon in the black hole of a galaxy about 55 million light years away in M87. How do we do this? Well, we do it a bit like the way that you measure a magnetic field, something else that you can't see. You sprinkle iron filings around a magnet and then the magnetic field structure reveals itself. An accretion disk of gas around a black hole is a bit like these iron filings because it helps us see the magnetic, the way that the iron filings help us see magnetic fields. An accretion disk helps us see gravitational field. Here is an example of an accretion disk taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in a distant galaxy, 4261. And here is a simulation that my colleague John Hawley prepared of what an accretion disk actually looks like, at least theoretically, when you view it from the side and from the top, the gas doesn't just abit, just doesn't orbit happily. Because of the presence of weak magnetic fields, the gas becomes turbulent and in fact ultimately accretes. So we can't really take a close-up picture of an accretion disk. Simulations are about the closest that we can get right now. So the basic instrument that took the picture of the black hole is a radio telescope as we discussed earlier in the talk. Not just one radio telescope, but a whole network. So here's a simple radio interferometer. T1 and T2, telescopes one and two. You have a wave front to a distant source. The blue is the trough, the red is the crest of a wave. And you notice that T2, I have a red crest, and at T1, I have a red crest. So if I took an instantaneous signal, I had a correlator hooked up between the two of them, I would get constructive interference. Back to our diagram. On the other hand, if I had a third radio telescope placed here, then the red crest and the blue trough, when I rehooked up the correlator, would measure destructive interference the right side of my diagram. And that is the trick by which astronomers reconstruct the image. 
they set up a whole network of these telescopes. And if you want better and better resolution, you need to do two things. Work with as short a wavelength as you can and work with what amounts to a telescope separation as large as you can. If you have just a single dish, it's the size of the dish. If you have many dishes, the relevant size is the distance between them. So we need a huge distance between our radio telescopes if we have a prayer of seeing something as small as a black hole. In fact, if you want to see the nearest black hole, it's equivalent to being on the surface of the moon, taking out a telescope and watching somebody eat an apple. I'll have it the other way around. It's like being on the earth and watching somebody eat an apple on the moon. Works both ways. So that's a, an enormous resolution that you have to strive for. So you need to work with very small wavelengths and huge telescope separations. In fact, you need the entire size of the earth in order to have a prayer of making this work. So you use the earth. And that's what the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium is. It's a global network of radio telescopes all over the world that reconstructed these incredibly complicated patterns of reinforcements and cancellations and correlations that were halfway in between cancellation and reinforcement. And they took all that mathematical information and then reconstructed the image that would give rise to those patterns. And that is a very complicated mathematical problem. And it is just about barely doable. In fact, it is doable, but it requires truly a global resources to do that undertaking. So this is quite an accomplishment. What you see here is the Event Horizon Telescope on the left, a simulation similar to the one of general relativity and an accretion disk surrounding it and what the light would look like. And then if we blurred the simulation to account for the limited seeing that we can, that's available to us, even with the Event Horizon Telescope, this is what you should see. And in fact, the two match extremely well. What about the future? Another way to measure gravitational radiation is to use pulsars. And if you have a gravitational wave which is passing through the galaxy, maybe because two supermassive black holes in a very distant galaxy merged, you would get gravitational radiation on this scale. Then the pulsar signals that are coming through that very slightly distorted space time due to the presence of gravitational wave, those pulsar signals would change in a very telltale pattern in such a way that you could reconstruct the presence of gravitational radiation. So that's for the future. Whether that works or not remains to be seen. It's a bit difficult because the interstellar medium is a complicated place, but that's one idea that people uh, are working on furiously. It's a big project, especially here at Oxford. The other very neat idea is LISA, which is a space-borne interferometric gravitational detector where you have the Earth, which is the blue dot here, and then a network of three interferometer arms in space that follow the Earth as it orbits, as you see in this video here. And because it's in space, the environment is much more strongly controlled. And so it's possible to get much greater sensitivities and to work at different frequencies of the gravitational wave, which will enable us to look for merging black holes of much larger masses. So here you see LISA 
in operation. And with luck, uh, Lisa will be operational in the 2030s, just about the time that many of you, uh, I hope, will be starting, well, not only starting, will be well into your own careers. A little late for me, I'm afraid. So I'm running out of time. In fact, I've run over. I apologize, but these are my last slides. We really have truly peered into the edge of space and time with our brains and with our extended senses. And what can I say? If the better angels of our nature can win our current all out struggle with what can only be described as forces of irrationality uh, all around the world, we may even get a peek of what lies beyond. And that of course is a goal that scientists have been struggling to do for centuries now. And I think with that final slide, that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much. All right. Can you? Ah. Stop sharing if you can. It'll be at the top. Only on the should I, I should stop share? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Barbus, for that uh, incredible, fascinating talk. Uh, you covered quite a range of <laughs> topics there as well, and um, all very comprehensively explained. So that was that was really brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, you. Particularly found it very mind blowing when you were explaining effectively what radiation is. That was a very new angle for me personally. Yeah, no, um, that, it's not often taught, but it's a uh, it's really a very powerful picture. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so we've received a number of questions um, on our various online platforms. Um, so I'll, I'll jump right in if that's sure. okay. Um, so you explain the different ways of observing and uh, towards the start of the talk. Um, how do we unite the the information that we receive from these different methods? And um, is there are there ever instances of discrepancies between them, uh, between the different sort of theoretical and, and computational observational methods? And and what what do we do in those sorts of instances? <laughs> that's a uh, that's a you know a vast uh, question. So um, the the sort of kind of state of the art observations that we're doing now um, are difficult enough that often there really is only one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. That is to say with gravitational radiation, for example, you pretty much just have to use the instruments that are available. So there's LIGO and Virgo now uh, mm -hmm. in Italy. And they both use gravitational radiation. And for those sources where they've observed them together, there hasn't been really uh, a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Now, something that arises, which is interesting and which isn't really necessarily set, I guess it, there could be discrepancies. So we've had a very interesting case where we had not black holes merging, but two neutron stars merging. And in contrast to black holes, when black holes merge, it's kind of bloop, the space time kind of disappears. And, you know, there's a lot of energy released, but it's in the form of gravitational radiation. There's not a lot of fireworks. But when two neutron stars bump into one another, that is a train wreck. And you get not only gravitational radiation, but you get all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. And you even get some nucleosynthesis going on and the emissions that that produces. And so there people have looked at that event, both at, with gravitational radiation, as well as with optical and radio mm -hmm. electromagnetic radiation. And Interestingly enough, the 
two are completely concordant. The kind of time scales that you measure with gravitational radiation are perfectly consistent with neutron star masses. And then the electromagnetic radiation that came out is also sort of consistent with the physics of neutron stars. So happily, there was agreement. So the field, I would say, isn't quite old enough now and mature enough to be measure carefully so that we have things that are discrepant that we need to right. figure out. That happens in cosmology, but not quite in this field yet. That's a long answer, sorry. No, that's absolutely, thank you very much for elaborating. Um, so two questions that are sort of related, so I'll, I'll, I'll merge them together. So what certainty do we have in the measure of the mass of a black hole? I think you did just sort of elaborate on this. And then does the mass of a star depend on the amount of hydrogen it has inside its core? So we have very good ideas now of the masses of the black holes in these gravitational mergers because we have a very extended time period over which to measure the gravitational radiation coming out. And so the, uh, that we have more than enough information to determine the masses individually of the black holes. It's not just a standard signal which could get bigger or smaller, and you don't know whether it's smaller masses farther away or bigger masses closer, because the actual shape of the signal changes with the masses. So we have a very good handle on that. So for example, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the two, the very first source that was detected, we know that those two masses were something like 32 solar masses each. And the actual numbers we know more precisely. And we know the mass of the remnant was three solar masses less, which meant that three times mc squared in energy was carried off by the gravitational radiation. So we know the mass of the black, of those black holes, we know the mass of the black hole at the center of, gal of our galaxy, the two significant figure, uh, which is what the other part of the Nobel Prize this year was awarded to, to Gensel and Gez for their fantastic work, just looking at the ordinary Keplerian orbits in the vicinity of that black hole. So we know it very well. So the other question was about, could you repeat that, was something about the mass of the star from its hydrogen content? Yes, exactly. Yep. So I'm not quite sure what that means we measure the masses of stars by looking at you know the their effect on objects around them in terms of the stellar modeling that we do um, we what we know is that depending upon how much hydrogen we put in initially and how much elements we will get a certain core mass at the end of its life so in that way I guess the answer is yes we know the core of the mass of the star by the relative proportion of hydrogen that's present through various kind of complicated chains. Okay, so it's it's certainly an input into the... Yes, so <laughs> you put it better than I did, exactly. It's an important okay. input. Um, great, thank you very much. Um, so we've got another question. Uh, how close are we to being physically certain? So you talked a lot about the, the sort of the geometry internally and the um, champagne flute as you described it um, and uh, you know the, where the threshold is of the the, the event horizon of, of a black hole and also um, you you when you were discussing the simulations for the accretion disk you said this is about as close as we'd get for the moment um, so how close are we to being able to actually observe an, an image in some other way uh, beyond just uh, theoretical computation um, well. And, you know, for once, I'm going to be somewhat pessimistic. I would say not really. The Event Horizon Telescope is about as good as we can get. Now, I'll share with you some dirty laundry with, that astronomers have. Um, so in the public, we talk about this being an Event Horizon, and it's fantastic. And it may be. 
Amongst astronomers, not everybody is convinced because that is just a barely resolved image. Mm. And so people argue about whether you're looking at a base of a jet kind of from the side going off, which mm. would also produce kind of a dark image in the middle, or whether you're really looking at the event horizon of an accretion disk. I think they're right. I think it is the event horizon of an accretion disk, but it's a lively topic of debate. Mm -hmm. So to do better, you would need to have a black hole that was closer and big. And so we have our own galaxy, but I'm afraid that's a very messy environment. And mm -hmm. even though it's closer, it's not much easier to observe. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you'd have to go to smaller wavelengths and we're already at kind of the limit of what we can do computationally. Mm -hmm. Or you need to have a baseline between the telescopes, which is bigger than the Earth. And at one point that would have been the end of the game. <laughs> but in our modern era, we can contemplate such a thing. And so there's talk about putting radio telescopes and using the Earth Moon baseline as the as an element in the array and to do to get higher angular angular resolution that way. And that will buy us a factor of 10 or 20 or something like that. And I think we won't be able to do much better than that for the foreseeable future. I mean, that already is pretty difficult to consider. That already, yeah, try to convince people to spend money to put radio telescopes on the moon. To do that, definitely. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, these are slightly more general. So we've got some other more specific questions coming. So, can gravitational lensing help detect black holes that might be floating outside the center of a galaxy? And also, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It's a comment that's yeah. In principle, there would be uh, that would be uh, the people. Um, I, I can't think of a, uh, an example of an unambiguous detection, but people do exactly that kind of thing in reverse. What they do is the absence of gravitational lenses by say a population of black holes. People are interested in whether dark matter consists of black holes. And they try to argue against that. Well, if there are black holes, they would accrete gas and they would be too bright. Um, well, we don't really understand whether that's really true because accretion is complicated. So, well, if you had enough of them, then you would, they would gravitationally lens against the distant galaxies. And by the absence of such gravitational lenses, people have been able to put upper limits on how many black holes, how many primordial black holes out there, there might be of various masses. So the physics of that question is absolutely correct. That is to say, it is entirely possible to predict and to uh, learn something about the mass of the black of a black hole by the strength of its gravitational lenses, lensing effect. Yeah. Great, thank you. We've still got a couple more questions, if that's okay um, with you. <laughs> um, so we've seen that this year's Nobel Prize was awarded to black hole research, and you you also touched on it. Um, Quite a bit in your presentation. So in your opinion, what, the, what are the next three big questions to address in black hole research? <laughs> um, well, I think it would be, we've, we know that they exist. So I think one, sort of technical problem that I'm very interested in. For a while, the big, the holy grail, which we've now achieved, it's one of those sad things that you work, people work for literally half a century from 1970 onwards to, you know, find a smoking gun and ambiguous black hole detect, and then they, then it works. So what do you do for an encore? Well, we still don't, we're still in our infancy when it comes to finding out detailed properties of black holes. So the next big area is to come up with techniques, perhaps better computations of gravitational wave emitted and better instrumentation so that we can measure the spins of black holes. 
um, we still don't know that well enough. In other words, the actual proof of the Kerr solution for a black hole, the Kerr, the Kerr geometry would be an area that would be fascinating to think of uh, how to, to get a handle on that. The other area of black hole research, which I love to think of from time to time, is there was a time early on, people were very interested in the question of primordial black holes. The early universe was a crazy place, and it's not such a crazy idea that parts of the initial universe might have been over dense enough to form and make black holes. And we're now in a situation where dark matter, there's of course enormous evidence for its existence, including some sort of precision simulations and observations. So we know it's there. Every particle theory explanation for dark matter has fallen flat. We've gotten nowhere. So people are starting to look more seriously at primordial black holes and whether we should consider them a little bit more seriously and to understand what kind of constraints can we put on them theoretically in the early universe and observationally now from things that we would expect to see that we don't see. So that's another area which is fascinating. And since you've pinned me to three, I guess the third question would be relating black holes to more standard astronomy. All of these black hole mergers that we're looking at, they kind of, they have sort of the wrong mass, so to speak, from the point of view of standard evolutionary theory. It's not so easy to figure out where a 30 solar mass black hole comes from because there seem to be a fair number of them around. Mm. And so doing more research in establishing the actual statistics of that, and then using that information back in the sort of the classical area of astronomy that has to do with the evolution of binary stars is another area which is, I think, going to be quite interesting and exciting in the next few years. Okay, so just maybe one or two more questions. So uh, I've got a question here. What kind of energy is consumed during the merging of two black holes and what kind of energy is emitted after this occurrence? So it's a funny question. What kind of energy? The only energy is actually, so when you say what kind of energy, that could either be what are the numbers in sort of in terms of watts, or it could be qualitatively, what sort of energy are we talking about? So that's an easy question. The second one is uh, energy in the form. It's kind of neat that you can distort the vacuum and there's an energy associated with that. Mm -hmm. And that's an honest to goodness energy, just as much as energy in an electric field is an energy or magnetic field. There is a, an energy uh, that we can talk about uh, in the form of gravitational radiation and its propagation through space and time. And an, an enormous amount of energy comes out. So typically, if you wanna to get to numbers, <laughs> what you have is you know, something which is on the order of taking several times the rest mass of the sun and turning it directly into energy via E equals MC squared. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I used to love to, well, not used to, I still love to say this. One of the things I love to say when I teach my course was that the original detection of the black hole merger was a release of energy equal to three times the mass of the sun times C squared. And I think that has got to be the largest explosion ever detected by humanity. And what it did, the way that we detected it was that it moved a mirror by 1% of the radius of a proton, 
I didn't get a chance to talk about that in the talk, but the sort of distortions we're talking about on the interferometer, it's not a great wonging change. It is literally not a fraction of an atom, but a fraction of the radius of a proton. So this enormous explosion caused a distortion on Earth of 1% of the radius of the proton, which has got to be the smallest displacement ever detected by humanity. So that was full of superlatives. <laughs> wow, and that's quite some vibration tolerance required as well. Oh my gosh, the engineering on this, and the, that's, that's the whole game to beat down the noise, to suspend these mirrors. And then of course, you know, I talked about constructive and destructive interference. Well, it's one thing to write it with pencil and paper and then line up the waves and, what, when you have lasers, how do you do that? How do you maintain that kind of phase coherence when it's oscillating 10 to the 18 times as, well, less, so 10 to the 12 times the second. And so the engineering that is 10 to the 15, I have to get my numbers right, a huge number in a second, to get the phase coherence and the phase locking at a level that it can be used was part of the ingenuity of that device. And so the one person who did that was somebody named Ron Drever. And he was absolutely critical to the uh, development of the first interferometers. And tragically, uh, you know, he died um, just before the Nobel Prizes uh, were announced. So he never did get to, to see the, the fruit of his work and to be recognized for it. Okay. So, but, uh, but that was uh, all of these engineering feats that go into this machine are, you know, amazing state of the art. Great. And um, we'll take one last quick question and a slightly broader question I'd like to end on. So there's a question, what are the estimated temperatures uh, of an accretion disk and within the jets? Um, well, that depends a lot on what the mass of the black hole is. So, the, just to keep matters focused and simple, for uh, an accretion disk, which is in a binary star system where you have say a 10 solar mass black hole and then an ordinary star feeding the accretion disk, the inner edge of the disk can get up to very high temperatures, 10 to the seven, 10 to the eighth degrees. So mm -hmm. very hard X-rays um, and it was X-ray astronomy that one of its main motivations was to find precisely these kinds of emissions as an indication for the existence of a black hole, because you need to get very, very close to the edge and an ordinary star, you wouldn't get temperatures that hot. Mm. And what was the second part of the question? Uh, and within the jets as well. Oh, and the jets themselves can get to uh, temperatures that are effectively relativistic, and you can produce electron-positron pairs. So that's probably what determines and also what limits how hot the jet can get. Okay, wow. Um, and so- Often a jet, you know why? Because you don't really have an equilibrium temperature. What you have is, and so you, you know, a temperature you associate with the Maxwellian distribution. In a jet, it's already so hot that the energies of the electrons start to depart in a significant way from a Maxwellian. So you get energies which are, you know, many hundreds of KeV just right. from, as I said, what limits it is the production of positron electron pairs. I see. Okay, wow. So hot, you can't even define a temperature. Putting on the distribution, okay, wow. Because the distribution function is different, yeah. Okay, wow. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so last question. Thank you so much. I okay. Over time. Last question, something we ask all of our speakers. Um, what advice would you give to early career astronomers who are currently trying to shape their research focus? <laughs> uh, I would say um, you should it's very promising so far. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 so hard. You I mean, 
you need to follow your heart. Uh, you need to do something that you love doing. Um, mm -hmm. And the, that sounds a little bit um, trite, but what you should avoid doing is to be too calculating and to work in areas that you think are going to be especially promising or going to be the future because you'll do your best work when you're working on something that is absolutely fascinating to you and, and all consuming. And if you're at a place like Oxford or a good place, you know, the people who are there, they're not gonna be working on particularly crazy things. Pretty much anything that's around will be of some interest to, to some people. But to be, I don't, I don't know any successful scientist uh, who is not kind of literally in love with the subject. And, you know, being in love is good, but being in love also drives you crazy a little bit. Uh, that is to say, you become obsessed. You think about things uh, all of the time. And so um, if you really want to, to be successful, that is the sort of commitment that that is involved. So it really is very important, A, to work on something which is genuinely fascinating to you. And um, your mentor also is a very important person uh, in your life. So work with someone with whom, you know, you have a good rapport mm -hmm. because, you know, working in early career stages, DPhils and postdocs, that's a, that's a very important relationship and you want it to be as pleasant as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you mentioned uh, at the very end, you, you put a nice quote up and you said, um, our, our struggles with the forces of irrationality. Yes. I was wondering what you meant by that. Well, we live in an area in a time when science uh, is uh, dismissed uh, lightly for political reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen uh, in, in, my, in my native country of the US and my adopted country in the UK, a little bit too much of that. Uh, I would say just in the last few weeks, there's a little glimmer of light on the horizon that things uh, will get better and people will respect scientists again mm -hmm. and take them seriously, not only in matters of public health, but in matters of interesting areas that are worth pursuing. Yeah, excellent. Great. Well, I'm sorry we've taken a lot of your time now. Well, it's been fun. I'm always happy to have an excuse to talk about this subject. Uh, it's a lot of fun for me. Honestly, uh, thank you for the invitation. We've received a lot of thanks and a, a lot of uh, a lot of comments, a lot of engagement with the with the live stream as well. And everyone's very very grateful for your time. Oh, thank you. Uh, we've also got some American uh, viewers as well. Someone from Michigan, USA. Oh. Wanted to get, I'm get a glad to hear. Well, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for uh, for setting this up and for being such a great host. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. And, uh, yeah, take I'll care. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Bye. Now. Bye.